tell us basically what you've learned. You know, what is it about all this social media stuff and cloud computing that works for the enterprise? And what, what, what are the barriers uh, what, what, that you've seen? And, you know, when, when I first heard Web 2.0, the phrase that, that you were instrumental in bringing into the world, I thought, give me a break. I thought it was old wine and new bottles from the tech sector and there was nothing to see here and you're trying to inject some life into a fairly boring period in the history of technology after the Y2K uh, fiasco and the dot-com crash and whatnot. And I had been studying what technology does to organizations and for organizations. And to oversimplify a huge amount, let's imagine three constituencies in an organization. You got the management, you got the technologists, and you got the rank and file. And again, to oversimplify a huge amount, what we have historically done inside organizations is the managers and the technologists get together and they kind of gang up on the rank and file and they impose solutions on them. And they impose workflows and they impose big ERP and they impose enterprise software and basically a bunch of smart guys get together, diagram how they want the business process to work, embed it in technology, and go impose it on the organization. Except every once in a while it works the other way and the technology comes creeping in through the back comes door. creeping and, in uh, and then we gradually accept the PC and grudgingly do that kind of stuff. But the basic story organizationally is, let's use technology to impose stuff on the work and file. And the mantra that I always used to teach my business school students was, if you want to control the outcome, control the process. If they walked out of my operations management class mumbling that in their sleep, I was really happy. You want to control the outcome, control, control the process. The pro you and want it, to control the outcome, control the process. Right, and if they fell asleep and their buddy nudged them when I called on them, that was kind of what I wanted them to say. <laughs> <laughs> what you teach people about their, their proper role in leading an organization. And where I really had my aha moment was when I was trying to understand Wikipedia, and I actually realized that Jimmy Wales and Larry Sanger believed that mantra themselves in their first iteration, which, like you know, was Newpedia, where they had a seven-step, very tightly defined workflow for generating encyclopedia entries. They wanted the editors to be widely recognized experts in their fields with all kinds of letters after their names, and they thought that they needed to bolt down the process, and they got nowhere with it, essentially. They spent a lot of money, a lot of time, had almost no interest or no finished articles, and it's only when they heard about this weird technology called a wiki, and they decided, over the objections of their board, their advisory board, to turn this thing on and see what happened. They called it Wikipedia. They came back, and they just saw the snowball rolling downhill, and it was when they were able to walk away from that mantra and realize that there are probably times when it's still appropriate. There definitely Well, are. except it isn't necessarily a change because of course Wikipedia has a very clear process, just a very different kind of process. They've got pillars, right? There's no prescribed workflow. You don't have to check your credentials. Yeah, and yeah, there's no yeah. professional editorial class. But by my old standards, it's incredibly loosey-goosey. Gotcha. And the weird thing... There's an architecture though that's you know, baked into the system. And it's been that, baked it, in over time yeah. as they've needed yeah. it. But it's kind of when this, when we started to question that mantra in all cases that I started to get excited about this 2.0 technology toolkit. I think there really was a there there. And then with my book, I tried to go take that to the organization and say to the managerial class there, look, you have this alternative. And what we see when we look out at the, at the web 2.0 world is the amazingly positive and powerful things that can happen yeah. when you use your technologists and the technology to empower the rank and file and harvest the good stuff that emerges. But it also from. does really mean thinking differently about your organization. Uh, I, I remember a meeting I spoke at, uh, it was a CIO group, and the CIO of Fidelity uh, saying, saying to me, he said, there's all this technology and we understand the technology, but we don't know how to organize ourselves to use it correctly. Right. Because the old models of industrial organization don't necessarily match the, uh, the kind of organization that you need uh, when you are using uh, say, social technologies, blogging, o open, permeable systems uh, to interact with your customers. But I, I, I agree with all that. I don't think that means that you need to throw away the org chart or the idea of hi hierarchy or the idea of management. Those things all still have very valuable roles to play. What's going on right now, I think, is not a substitute for all that stuff, but this fantastic complement to it, where in addition to having kind of a top-down approach and a directive style, you can also take advantage of exactly the reverse of that, which is a very open, participative, collaborative, let's not define stuff in advance, but get the good stuff that comes out of letting our people do what they want and interact with each other as but they want. Let's come back to Wikipedia for a moment, though. 
It seems to me that uh, Wikipedia only looks like uh, sort of a magic bottom-up uh, thing that happens uh, without any organization. This actually, first of all, there's the, the architectural design of the site itself. Many people, for example, have tried to use wikis to write full-length books, and it doesn't work. Right. You know, so there's this idea, for example, there's an atomic unit of content, uh, which is a subject, and some small number of people really care about that, and they're able to self-organize around that. So Wikipedia isn't really uh, so much a community as it's a community of communities. Of communities, yeah. Uh, th there's all these little interest groups, each of which cares passionately about a single page. And the great thing to and me is And then there's a layer above that where who, people Which who, cares about the organization. Yeah. Absolutely. So people, but people are self-selecting into all those roles is one right. fantastic part. But not, cool thing, but not every problem matches that kind of architecture. That, so there's that first architectural insight, which is that certain kinds of problems lend themselves to self-organization better than others. Absolutely, and like we see with the differences between networks like Facebook, where they're symmetric, and you're my friend and I'm yours, versus Twitter, where you don't have to follow me if I follow you. There are these different flavors of architecture out there. As we get more experience, we're learning which of them is appropriate in, the, in, in different circumstances and for different uses. Right, and, and then I guess part of what you've been trying to understand is uh, what are the commonalities, first off. Yeah. And, uh, what are some of the issues that you've put your finger on as you've been looking at this phenomenon over the last uh, you know, four or five years? One, the, one of the deepest commonalities I see is in addition to this idea of not imposing stuff up front but harvesting the good stuff that emerges and letting people self-organize is this idea that these tools are fantastic at making our human networks a bit less important. I want to be very careful at what I mean by that. Um, our ability to get stuff done is constrained by who we know, right? Our human networks are incredibly important, and we all have a rel relatively small network of strong ties, close colleagues, and a big network of weak ties, people we just, professional acquaintances. There's an even bigger network of people out there who would be good, valuable colleagues for us if only we knew about them, but we don't right now. Historically, we have had really lousy mechanisms to expand that circle of weak ties and to figure out which of the potential ties sh should become actual colleagues of ours. So we rely on folk like you who convene people all the time. We rely on these weird human Rolodexes. If you're not lucky enough to know one, you're kind of c constrained in what you can That's do. Right. What these technologies are so fantastic at is with things like Facebook, allowing us to build very big, robust, weak tie networks, keep on top of what they're doing, exploit them, ask them our questions and harvest them that way. And when I talk about blogging and microblogging and narrating your work, the big purpose of that as I see it is so that you can, other people can discover that you're the right guy to talk to and you can discover by looking at what they've been doing, yeah. what, what they're good at and who would be a good colleague for you. So uh, you use that phrase narrating uh, your work uh, as a description of the function of corporate blogging when we were together at a McKinsey event in Rome. And it really struck me as the most cogent uh, argument for business blogging that I've ever heard yeah. in that one phrase. Uh, because when you narrate your work, you are creating the possibility of uh, people who you did not know needed to know Yep. learning about it versus directed communication. You write a report, you send it to the distribution list, and the people who you already knew uh, ought to know about this are, are informed. Right. Uh, but it, and it, it is a way of creating thin... these new weak ties when you basically share your work in public. And the other way that we used to do that or tried to in organizations was with these kind of corporate white pages, which were really static, thin, not updated very often. And whenever I asked my students who came out of the big consulting companies, did you use those things? They'd say, no, it's ridiculous. I'd email my buddies to see if they knew somebody who knew somebody. Again, that's dependent on the people you already know. When, if you narrate your work, and I wish I could take credit for the phrase, but Dave Weiner, blogging pioneer, came up with the phrase, if you do that, people can discover what you're working on, what you know, what your, where your expertise clearly is, and all kinds of great connections get formed when they, they just could not have happened otherwise. Uh, Lou Platt, who was the former CEO of Hewlett Packard, back when Hewlett Packard had uh, fewer problems with its CEOs, said <laughs> that uh, if only HP knew what HP knows, 
we'd be three times as productive, which is just a beautiful summary of the problem of running any big system. You know there's redundancy, you know people aren't working together that should be, and this toolkit is a big step forward in helping us with that problem. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting, because I, I remember talking to Bernardo Huberman at HP Labs about a work that, uh, some work they were doing for Schlumberger, actually in document management, identifying people who had particular knowledge and skills based on the documents that they had yep. checked out. And that's, in some ways, a top-down centralized way of uh, trying to achieve that, whereas simply having people share what they're doing more publicly more pub yeah. creates that uh, 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 sort of cascade of uh, knowledge throughout the organization. And if I link to your blog a bunch of times, those are all votes that, that you're actually a good person mm -hmm. for other people to know about. So we've got this nice self-organizing system, this card catalog of the organization that has this cool geodesic dome property right. where the bigger it gets, the stronger it gets. But now here's this issue that I think uh, you know, is clearly faced uh, in a corporate setting, uh, but I think is even more potent for government. And that is that uh, social media is inherently personal. It's about me. And you, know, you, you, uh, uh, you, know, you can write all you like uh, on a blog, but if it's approved by the PR department, it's not really a blog. Yep. Uh, and uh, in, in some sense, uh, you know, one of the things we see in social media feels a little bit like the rise of free agency in sports. You know, it used to be people belonged to the team, you know, or they belonged to the movie studio back yep. in the you know, gl glory days of Hollywood, and then all of a sudden you had movie stars. And now all of a sudden, individuals stand out. Yep. Um, uh, I just saw a notice that Jared Cohen is leaving the State Department. Okay. You know, and Jared Cohen matters because you know he made a name for himself there through uh, you know social media. Now again, obviously lots of other people matter, and, yep. but I, I, I think that um, how, how do organizations deal with the fact that people who who were previously hidden within the organization, encapsulated within it? now become so much more visible. Why would you want those people hidden, though? Like, what was the organizational benefit to having those Oh, I, I'm not saying there was. I okay. think but the organizations the, they struggle with that. They, they, I've seen them have really different reactions to exactly that phenomenon. Most of the forward-thinking ones that I've come across have realized the benefits to them of having their people demonstrate their expertise to the world at large, even if it means they might get poached more frequently. But in an era of LinkedIn and an era of all these different social ties, you can't keep people from broadcasting their human capital to the world, you might as well try to take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. So if you think about um, success stories and failures from corporate use of 2.0 technologies, give me your top couple of successes and your top couple of failures. Um, the, one of the main, main failure modes I see is what you alluded to earlier, which was when someone says, okay, we need a blogging environment, and there's a 50-page policy document about what good blogging consists of, which can get reduced down to, we'd prefer if you didn't blog. And then the CEO decides to launch a blog, and it's clearly generated by, uh, by her PR department. It's got no human tone to it. They've got the comments turned off on it. And it's just another megaphone to go shout at the world, either internally or externally. What we see instead is if there's some measure of authenticity, and there are lots of different ways to get that across, if we see that, again, either behind the firewall or to the world at large, I start to get a lot more excited. And if we can get the formal and the informal leaders of the organization to start participating and contributing, Contributing, then, then I think we're off to the races. All right, um, you didn't give me uh, the successes, uh, but uh, the uh, let me ask you just uh, another question, just about the meme du jour, which is, um, does the internet make us stupid? You know, Nick Carr. You know, it's, it, it, I, I have to give Nick a lot of credit. Nick wrote the article a while back, IT Doesn't Matter, which I have vehemently disagreed with. Right, a lot right. Well, but, he seems contrarian, and, and in each case, he puts out a very provocative uh, assertion, which is gets people to think, but yep. it's fundamentally wrong. Well, <laughs> and the jury's still out on us becoming stupid or not. I don't agree with it, but I give him a huge amount of credit because he has this gift for focusing us on the right question. Yeah. So a few years back, it was, what's the, what's the business benefit of all this technology? Now it's, wait a minute, we have these always on, always on us technologies. They're so addictive. And remember, just a few years ago, 
we weren't really worried that the social kids were spending too much time with computers, you know? That was what I did when I was a teenager, and I was the least social kid on the planet. We've hit this weird flip where the technologies are so seductive to us that we're now worried about well-adjusted kids spending too much time with technology. I find that a positive development overall, and I think that the kids are going to be all right. I, I think that, it, that we, these technologies are rewiring our brains, but reading a book we want rewires our brains. Well, watching TV rewires our brains. Our brains are plastic things. That's right. I, I always love that. My my uh, my brothers used to tease me when I was a kid because I was such so bad at sports and everything else. They used to refer to me as the failed hunter gatherer because <laughs> I always had my nose in a book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, well, I think uh, our, our time is up. I, I, I love what you do in thinking about the intersection of organizations and, uh, and uh, new technology. I urge everybody to uh, follow you as you narrate your work. Fantastic, so, thanks, thanks, Tim. All right, thank you very much. And uh, the, the sponsor of the reception is out uh, in, in the lobby. Uh, I hope you'll join us there. I think we are done for the day. Thank you so much for your time and attention. It's been a wonderful day. I've learned a lot. Thank you.